Life is about constant evolution. Always better today than we were yesterday. Welcome back to another edition of The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday. I'm Scott Williams, and with me again is Andrew Dow, uh, SOAS coordinator for Naval Special Warfare Center. And uh, Andrew, welcome back. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's always great to come in here and, you know, just do some talking about SOAS and about the community and see how we're doing and get that answers to the questions that a lot of people have out there uh, answered for them. Yeah, uh, on that note, we do have a whole electronic mailbag full of emails from folks who have questions about SOAS. And we'll remind you, SOAS is? So SOAS, SEAL Officer Assessment Selection. Thank you. Held once a year, three blocks of training during the summer. Uh, and applications are due in February. And can I just put one thing out, Scott? Yeah, what's up? Uh, something that's interesting and a lot of questions I get is... Um, you know, a lot of reference back to these podcasts and, uh, thank you for allowing us to do this, but something I want to add to all the listeners out there is if, if you do have specific questions, please, please reach out to me. Uh, I'll leave my email on the website of sealswick.com so you can reach out. But if you have questions that you want answered on a podcast, please send them directly to me and, um, I'll hopefully get invited again by you, Scott, and, uh, have a conversation and answer some of those questions. Well, it would be our honor. Um, yeah, we, we actually get quite a few questions about SOAS. And, you know, basically SOAS is how we pick our Navy SEAL officers now. And uh, it's it's a pretty formal process. It, it happens before um, candidates are actually allowed to come to BUDS and go through the pipeline. It's this pre-selection process. Mm-hmm. It's pretty rigorous, and we've refined it over the years here at Naval Special Warfare Center and you've been here since the ground floor and a lot of these questions you know um, of course we get the same ones you know quite frequently but we also get a lot of interesting questions and and if I might um, I'll just start out with one of those okay and I, and I thought it was particularly interesting um, because we always talk about the physical aspects of SOAS uh, but this listener actually wanted to know more about the interview process and the writing assessments. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So a quick intro to that is before you even get to interviews at SOAS, you have to complete assessment week, right? The five days assessment week. Upon completion of that, then you will move into interviews and other exposure type activities that so as staff provides for the candidate to kind of get a better idea of what the community is doing in a junior officer uh, role and capabilities. But the during assessment week, that's when you'll do writing assignments. I think, I think right now we have uh, slotted, I believe, two different writing assignments. And don't everyone, don't freak out those questions. It's not like really challenging essay questions, but it is important topics that relate to world issues. Uh, we like to have uh, writing assignments that lead towards debates and how you're, we'll give you a, uh, a side that you have to be either for or against and debate that topic. Uh, writing assignments include, hey, what's your opinion on um, the current footprint of some of those larger nations that we are um kind of bumping heads with those types of political and world view world issues that we're dealing with we want to get your opinion on those and that's some of the writing assignments you'll see as for interview process and oh, excuse me interview uh the time frame for interviews is usually you'll conduct two interviews during the second week of your SOAS block that you attend uh, one will be a psychological interview with naval special warfare centers psychologists and then following that, you will complete a community interview, which is uh, held by a SEAL officer and a senior enlisted. So a senior enlisted is someone who is an E7 or above. That could be a chief, a senior chief, a master chief, a warrant officer that will sit down and kind of give you a job interview for about 90 minutes. 
and they're going to ask you real questions. They want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear just the fluffed up cookie cutter answers. They want to hear really what your thoughts are on the questions they ask. And, you know, they, they can see right through you if you're trying to give the answer that they want to hear. You need to right. give the answer that you believe in. And that, that's, that's something we truly look at. A little originality, Absolutely. a little creativity, something to show how your mind works, that it's spry and not uh, rigid. Right. You know, because SEAL officer is someone who is a SEAL, but someone who is also an officer. Mm -hmm. And that officer part requires them to be eloquent in how they convey their thoughts. You're going to be briefing an admiral someday or briefing, you know, this, that, or the other person. You got to be able to do written communication reasonably well. You Absolutely. Know, need to be able to speak. These are all great points. Absolutely. And it is so important, just like you said, you're an officer first, you know, and your job is a, is a SEAL. So it is, a, it is so important to ensure that you are, you know, being true to yourself and being an acceptable role model and representation of the United States Navy. Okay. that That's a nice look at, um, you know, the head piece of all this how you think and you know how you respond but um a more general question we got was hey you know what are the trading evolutions like at SOAS and you know like what specifically what are some of the more notable events and what does the day-to-day -day look like okay so candidates check in the SOAS blocks start on a Saturday but the actual physical evolutions won't be until Sunday so the first evolution that any candidate will complete is the SEAL PST which is consists of a uh, 500 yard swim 100 push-ups 100 sit-ups in two minutes max pull-ups and then a mile and a half run uh, the run is in shorts and sneakers so people aren't confused you do not have to run the run in boots and camouflage uh, utilities but that's the first evolution you need to do and if you fail that you get sent home because you're expected to perform and meet our expectations on day one right so it is important that aspiring seal candidates know that you know you you, you submit a pst in order to get down selected to be invited to soas that pst needs to be passing but not just passing I mean, on the SEAL SWIC website, we have optimum scores for the PST for SEAL officers. That can be referenced and looked at, but, you know, you should be striving to do the best you can and to either match that or beat that at SOAS proper. So it's Sunday. That's the big, that's the big nail-biting evolution on Sunday. Mon Monday is when things physically kick off. Um, I won't go into the micro of evolutions, but I'll give the generalities of it. You will see logs, just like in buds. You'll see boats, just like in buds, whether it's on your head, running around, or in the surf, paddling out and doing some surf passage. Uh, some, some things candidates will see that they may not show uh, do as much in buds is rucking. Uh, the candidates will be expected to run f with a 45 pound rucksack uh, basically, it's just a sandbag inside of a backpack, and they'll be expected to run an unknown distance for an unknown amount of time at max effort, and that their time will be calculated into their overall slowest score. Uh, yeah, that, that's in boots. And that is in boots and in um, naval, uh, NWU Type 3s, which are the green Navy pattern camouflage. I'm used to saying BDUs, as a lot of us yeah. older fellows are, <laughs> right? But it's NWs. They will, so the ruck run's a big one, but not just physical evolutions. There's, there's going to be some mentally challenging evolutions for these candidates to attack. Uh, some being, there could be memory tests, there could be uh, communications over radios. That, you know, we'll give them a scripted um, communications dialogue that we will be reading one end they'll be reading the other while they're doing a physical evolution mm. and they need to be able to answer the questions we're sending to them clearly concisely in a proper uh radio etiquette form right so for example like they could be running you know a four mile run but they have a radio in their hand and we're going to ask them a really challenging math question or maybe we'll ask them hey who is the secretary of defense or just random questions. Or maybe we'll give them a scenario and pretend that they're a ground force commander within the SEAL teams and give them an, uh, put them in an, a, an example where they have to 
problem solve and hey what's your best how would you approach this while they're doing the physical evolutions so it's it we're going to challenge the candidates when they're at SOA, especially during the evolution phases and these really have practical applications absolutely I mean, I've heard absolutely about, you know being on a dead run and under fire and still having to call in mm -hmm. you know air to ground support or whatever we, um, we try to incorporate real life uh situations that you know these potential seal officers may see you mm -hmm. know i mean uh the world's changing the enemies it's it's different than what it was 10 years ago but you need to be prepared for the basics and be able to do what you know we were um what we're trained to do whether it's you know on land air sea whatever it may be we need to be able to perform and perform well and successfully when we're put under stress so it's it, that we're testing that i mean other evolutions that they'll see is there'll be some water evolutions um there's can be some evolutions with with utilizing the obstacle o course the o course but they won't formally do the o course as they do in buds but they will be uh, challenged with some kind of evolution regarding the old course. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the evolutions physical happens right where buds is right next door on the same beach, on the same, uh, area that all the bud students are going through. So everything that they s do during SOAS will give them a kind of idea what to expect when they, if they get invited and selected to buds. Yeah, it's quite the preview. And we, we have all new facilities now. Uh, basic training command has a brand new building got a brand new pool out there uh but the sand is the sand and the o course is still the o course yes well um let's let's take a look at another question that we have from one of our listeners one of our many many listeners uh my my producer here tells me what are the top three traits that make a great team leader Ooh, which of course is something they're going to be looking for right. during so as so let's first define team leader right that in that may be a new term for candidates coming into the military team leader think of it as like the team captain or the the president of a club or the person who's in charge the officer in charge oic team leader can also be an enlisted personnel uh the senior man or woman that's in charge of a, a specific task but what traits we're looking for for team leaders um, I think the most common and most obvious one is you need to set the example, lead from the front, be that person that others are going to look to for guidance and for influence and for motivation to be able to complete the task at hand. Uh, we also have some things as a team leader when you'll be incorporated this as soon as you get to SOAS is everyone will be separated through height line specifically, just like in BUDS, and they'll be designated boat crew leaders. That is a leadership position that we're going to be assessing specifically so that we can get a good read on their leadership qualities and capabilities. And we will rotate every candidate yeah. through this position so they all get an opportunity to shine mm -hmm. or sink. Uh, honestly, that's the whole point of this, is to get data on the candidate so we can make a, a, a educated and a exact determination on who would be selected to go and you're to still doing peer evals right yes yep yeah talk, so, talk to us a little bit about so, that uh peer evals so we have peer evals and assessor evals what an assessor is when you come to SOAS, there's going to be instructors right they're going to be the ones leading the evolutions making sure everything's run safely and uh according to how we planned everything but on top of that there will be seal and swick um as well as uh, combat personnel that are supporting Naval Special Warfare to serve as assessors. What their role is, is to one, and to make sure everyone knows this, is everyone, nothing outranks safety. So they're always watching to ensure that everything is being run safely. If they see something, they say something. But their primary role is to ensure that data is being collected on the traits we're looking for in SOAS. Those traits being team ability, Right, working as a team, physicality, how physically strong and physically, um, how physically strong and how well you are performing under stress, uh, your cognitive ability, how well you think on your feet with mental challenges and uh, types of classroom work or those as we I discussed earlier the 
the the writing assignments uh, or the debates that we talk about. So cognitive ability and probably one of probably one of the most important ones is character, right? Who you are as an individual, who you are as a person, and how you relate with others. Um, so those four things is the things we are looking at, and that's what the role of the assessor is: is to each evolution we'll be looking at one, two, three, or even all four character traits, uh, tr excuse me, traits, and they will be documenting how each candidate hits those traits. So for example, um, you and me are under a BOKU, Scott, and I'm the BOKU leader. So right now I'm being assessed for uh, my, my character and my team ability and physicality since we're under a boat. So those three traits would be being assessed. The assessor's watching the boat crew leader, but also watching every boat crew to see how they're performing. Are they following the directions of the boat crew leader? Uh, is the boat crew leader giving clear and concise guidance on what they need to do? Is he, is he or her pushing his, boat, his or her boat crew to the, through the evolution and trying to do the best they can? These are all being documented on a score. Mm -hmm. And these scores get added to their overall data card. And that data card collects all the scores throughout the SOAS evolutions and those points then get added up and then you get a total score at the end of SOAS. And the peer eval that comes as part of it? Thank you. And so to circle back, what the peer eval is, the assessors have their evaluation where they look at each individual candidate and assess whether this candidate is doing great, if, if he or she is slacking, or if they're just being a gray man. I'm, and I'm sure some of the listeners heard that term, but that is a big term in the NSW. Gray man being someone who's, hey, just there, not really putting out the effort or making themselves heard, but they're just getting through. So you don't want to be a gray man, not in our community. But the peer evals, each individual candidate will uh, rank their peers uh, so I believe we do five throughout the week and you know I understand some of the beginning ones will be challenging because most of these uh, uh, candidates don't know each other unless you're a Naval Academy guy or gal uh, ROTC may know each other but they're from all over so it gives an opportunity for each candidate to grade and give a score to each other candidate on a score of, I, I believe it's zero to five, five being, hey, this person is someone I would love to serve with. They, they, in my eyes, represent what a good SEAL officer should be, in their opinion. Um, or a, a one to where, hey, this person is, has, is very risky and is unsafe on certain evolutions. So they are rating each other throughout the week. So in the beginning, like I said, they may not know each other, but towards the end of the week, those peer, peer evaluations are very important because now they're getting to know each other, what's happening behind the scenes and what the assessors and instructors don't see. The peers evaluation will show what's actually happening. Okay, and so the peer evals, um, those are weighted into the overall composite score. Like how much of a percentage would the opinions of my fellow SOAS participants have on my outcome? I'm not really free to speak on the scoring of SOAS specifics. Uh, that is a you know, close hold secret we don't really want to share uh, with the audience. But what I can tell you is the peer evaluations does carry some bearing and weight. Um, it may not be the end all be all uh, thing that the selection panel looks at when we're looking at candidates, mm -hmm. but it does, it does raise interesting talking points for the interview process so for example if when we have their scorecard at the end of the week and there's a lot of red red meaning bad those red points are going to be addressed during the interview to see if they're truly what their peers think they are hmm. right we want to get an understanding and this helps us really understand the whole person and ensure that we're selecting the correct candidates to go on to buds so, so I don't have to worry if I'm, if I'm participating in SOAS, I don't have to worry too much about winning the popularity contest, but I do have to take a reasonable person approach to this and not be, you know, a jerk to all my classmates and not that, expect that, those, some those kind are of, great points. you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> blow back from that. You know, several years ago, we had a, uh, a candidate who the term brown nosing. And the instructor saw that right away. And it was very clear that they were saying what the instructors wanted them to say mm -hmm. in front of the instructors. But when it came 
to when the instructors or assessors weren't around, they completely did a 180. I mean, we weren't born yesterday. We're going to see these types of candidates and we're going to understand that, hey, this person's just playing the game. Um, understanding, though, there is parts where you have to play the game, right? But at the end, we want to ensure that what I what we like to see is, you know, candidates are good people. They care about what they're doing and care about the person they're doing it with, right? And that they are um, doing the best that they can, even when no one's looking. And yeah, genuine authenticity, I yes. think, would go a long Perfect. way. Perfect. Perfectly stated. Well, it's true. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not just on here to say that, hey, we're looking for X, Y, and Z, but we want good people in this community. This community is a great community, mm -hmm. and we want we only want the best for it. So that's why we're looking for the best candidates that can come here and continue the tradition of Naval Special Warfare. Well, and I don't think you can say there is... Um, From an officer's point. Like a penultimate example of someone that is, you know, the, the icon of NSW per se, right? Because you want a lot of diversity of background and experiences on the teams because that makes you stronger, right? Without a doubt, diversity, uh, different life experiences, all these things add up to make a, a, a better operator in the end and, and being an, a better officer to lead men and women in combat. If it and comes a down team, to that. I would imagine. Oh, without a doubt. Um, so let's say I'm the lucky person and uh, I get uh, notification that I am invited to SOAS. And, I've, you know, I've got four to six weeks uh, before that happens. Uh, what do you recommend I should do in those last few weeks before going to SOAS? This is a question, specific question from one of our listeners. Um, you know, how do you spend those last let's say four to six weeks before so as you know preparing so before i hit on that one of the big things is canada's showing up and showing up with injuries you know that they sustained because they train too hard uh I, i'm not a physical expert i'm not a uh, a coach i'm not i don't have a plan for you but it's it goes without saying you should you know you should be peaking at so as mm -hmm. You should be peaking at buds. So when you show up, you should be in the top, all all cylinders firing, top performance capabilities that you have, and show that off at SOAS. And if you go to buds, same thing. So within those last six, you know, say six weeks prior to, you should be meeting your your personal records in long distance running, in you know your swim times, in your rucking. Uh, you should be hitting your personal goals and feel like you can do this nonstop, you know, without hurting yourself. You do because I it's happened so many times since I've been here where candidates six weeks show up to SOAS and they said, Oh, I was training extra and they show up to SOAS injured and then they're a great candidate on paper, but they show up and it's just they're not they're not cutting it because they hurt themselves. They overtrained. I mean should they be taking the cold showers and you That's know That's not necessary. Either you know <laughs> Right, that that fable where hey, I need to take a cold shower every night to be prepared for the cold oceans of the Pacific. Let me tell you, it's going to be cold no matter what. The ocean in the Pacific's beautiful, but it is cold. Yeah, that is just something you got to deal with, and that's one of the mental challenges. But the bottom line is, six weeks out, your training should you should have a good training regimen. You should be meeting your goals of your personal records, what you want to do, and how you, your scores you want to meet. Um, but the important thing is to stay healthy, continue to maintain good nutrition, good health, stretching, and not getting injured prior to going to show SOAS. Um, it's just so important, and it, it, it really you know breaks our heart from an instructor or assessor or from my point of view uh, to see a candidate that you know all they wanted to do was be a SEAL officer and then to show up and get hurt um, and then have to wait a whole nother year to uh, apply mm -hmm. and attend it's it's very um it's very challenging but that's why i say six weeks out two weeks out start to taper down start to rest recover that's something you should be all planning to do anyway after every evolution that you do at home whether it's working out at the gym going for a long run or a swim make sure you're having a rest and recovery period after the fact so that you are healed to continue training whenever that may be yeah and get some sleep. I mean, um, 
last thing you want to do is deselect yourself because you got injured over training for buds. Yes. Got that. Um, should they be, you know, studying their NF or their uh, NSW uh, lore and you know trivia and all that? Uh, are hey, they going to get asked those kind of questions? Absolutely. I mean, you're coming into a community. You, you should know something about it, right? Yeah. Know the date it was created, which teams are where. I know, right? The evens on the east, odds on the west. Mm -hmm. um, just knowing just simple facts about it is important. Uh, I suggest everyone read the Seal Ethos, right? That's a lot of truth. A lot of experienced senior leaders uh, came together and put that uh, ethos together. And it's, it's a great piece of work and something that, uh, you know, I still follow. And it is, it's something that SEALs follow and live by. And it is important that uh, candidates know what they're signing up for, what they want to become. So it's important to know the background of where they're going. Right, you don't go to Burger King and ask for a Big Mac. So. <laughs> no, you don't. No. <laughs> Treat it like an actual job interview yeah. and be ready and know what you're getting into. Sounds good. Well, thank you again uh, for answering some of these questions. Um, we get we get tons of them on SOAS. And, yeah, and just uh, again, everyone listening, just if you have questions, shoot me an email so I can address, you know, I can come back on a podcast and talk to Scott here and... Um, get those questions answered for you all right andrew thank you very much and thank you everyone for joining us for another episode of the only easy day was yesterday i'm scott williams we'll see you next time there's nowhere to hide in hell with jets if you've been skating through bugs so far you will not do so any longer Get off your knees.